and if we can. <coughs> Revelation chapter 15, we left off in verse number 8. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from His power. Thank you, Brother Larry. And no man was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. Can I just say this? It sure is good on a Wednesday night to see you folks here. Amen. Amen. Uh, it's a real blessing. I'm glad you're here. Every shape, form, and size and everything, I know you've got a lot going on, but it's a blessing to see you here tonight, man. Amen. I appreciate it, man. It's an encouragement to me. Verse 18, or chapter 16, verse 1. And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your ways and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. And the first went and poured his vial upon the earth, and there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon, me, upon the men which had the mark of the beast and upon them which worshipped his image. Now, if it falls upon them that have the mark of the beast, when does that have to take place? Tribulation. Tribulation, Tribulation right? That's right. So it can't be for you. That's right. right. Amen. Impossible. You don't have to worry about taking the mark of the beast, That's seeing right. the mark of the beast, worrying about the mark of the beast, worrying about your driver's license, social security card, whatever it may be, being the mark of the beast, your car tag, or them tracing you, trailing you through everything they're trailing you through nowadays and all that kind of stuff. You don't have to worry about all that. You say, why? You're not in it. That's right. You're not going to be in it. That's right. So let's just say, I'm not saying, let's, let's just take for a for instance that you took what people consider to be the mark of the beast. They, they cheap chipped you in the hand or something or in the head, and they chipped you and said, well, you got the mark of the beast now, so you're, you're doomed. No, I'm not. I'm saved. Amen. you got a chip in you. you got the mark of the beast. No, it don't make no difference to me. i got his mark on me, and Amen. you can't pluck me out. Amen. Don't get too consumed with that stuff. Amen. Don't get all worried about that kind of a deal. I don't know what they may do. That's now, I'm right. going to tell you, I'll let you sit in just a second, but I'm going to tell you Come something. When the Jews went to Auschwitz and Treblinka and Dachau and all of those places over there, they put a number on them. Every one of them, they put a mark on them. That wasn't the mark of the beast. Okay? They didn't buy or sell or get gained. That was the way that the Germans kept up with where they were, what they were doing. I mean, they kept exact record. That's how they know all that stuff transpired. The Germans were their own worst enemy. They kept records of everything, yeah, right, exact right. records of everything, wow. yep. and experiments in the whole nine yards. It's not just eyewitness accounts. It's their own records that testify against them, and pictures and the whole nine yards. All right, you come along here. When you get uh, born nowadays, you get a Social Security number the second you're hatched because the government figures somewhere along the line they're going to have to get taxes from you. That's why they're interested in tracking you. It's not because you're valuable or because right. you're a threat to society. It's we're going to get our pound of flesh out of you. That's right. Amen. Now, if you want to resist that and that kind of a stuff, and I don't want my kids to have a Social Security number, then you're going to be up the creek with no means of motivation, as the preacher used to say, when it comes time for them to be able to buy or to sell or to get a job or whatever or to go to school because you can't do anything anymore without a Social Security number. Right. Amen. And when you get old and you start bumping up there in the 60s and all, and it gets time to think, well, shoot, I'm finally going to get a little... Uh, wealth, what do they call that thing that comes in? Uh, Social, uh, Social Security money that comes in or whatever. You can't get it if you don't have Social Security money. But it's not the mark of the beast. Right. Amen. Father, bless your word. Thank you, God, for these people. Thank you for what a blessing it is to see them here tonight. I pray, God, you'll bless them for their willingness to come and help us as we look into these things. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. I just want to make you a practical application of this thing when it comes to this cloud that's there, this smoke and the glory of God that's there. You know what they say? Uh, where there's smoke, there's fire. Right. You're commanded in Ephesians chapter number 5 to be filled with the Holy Spirit. That's what he tells you. Right. Now, you know, let me, let me clarify one thing. I don't know why this stuff, it's, it's always some educated individual that comes up and starts stirring all that up. Here's what they want to try to tell you. Well, the Spirit and ghosts are the same thing. They're not the same. Do you find? Because in the English words, they're spelled differently. Right. Spirit has to do with corporately. Ghost has to do with individually. Right. Right. Don't be afraid of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Okay? You each get the Holy Ghost. We all Amen. got the Holy Spirit. Amen. Did you get that? Amen. Right now I'm praying that the Lord will fill me with the Holy Ghost. If you want to say, Lord, fill him with the Holy Spirit, that's fine. That's fine. I'll take my portion. But dealing with it, fill me with the Holy Ghost. Allow me to individually to be filled so that I can dump something out on the individuals here. Amen. But Amen. corporately, we need the body of Christ filled with the Holy Spirit. Amen. Individually, we need to be filled with the Holy Ghost. Amen. All right? Now, you want to understand this. The Bible tells you to be not drunk with wine, wearing his excess but be filled with the Holy Ghost. I heard a preacher say not long ago, he said, well, you're not supposed to act like a drunk. Well, there are some things I, I understand that what he's saying there, uh, but the spirit of the prophets is subject to the prophets. It's not talking about being completely out of control. However, it is talking about you being outside your flesh. Amen. 
What that means is, is a drunk doesn't care whether or not you're laughing at him or not. A drunk doesn't make any difference to him what you think about him. A drunk is generally generous. It's kind of like, you want one? I'll give you one. I'll, I want you to feel as good as me. I'll buy you one, you know. Now, of course, I realize there's downsides to that thing. They wind up with all kinds of problems and all kinds of busting up homes and right. causing all kinds of addictions. But when the Bible says this, are not these that speak uh, drunk on new wine, talking about in the middle of the day they're over here drunk because they're, they're acting like they're, they're preaching. That's all they're doing. They're not up there acting the fool, but they're preaching like it matters, like Amen. preaching like they care. Good. And preachers nowadays are never accused of being drunk in the pulpit. Because they're always worried about what somebody's going to say. A drunk is bold, man. They're stupid. They're flat out. They ain't got no sense at all. I mean, I've seen drunks run their hand through a windshield. I've seen them drive through car windows. And it's funny. They, they're sitting there. They're driving down the road. You can pull right up by them on a motor, and you'll see them. They're lining that thing up, and they're trying to drive that thing. In their mind, they think they got it. And it's like if they close one eye, then it, you know, it quits moving on them like that on the wind and scare them to death. But anyway, you go, you get them driving like this and then they pull over and they say, well, we're good. Well, I was doing fine. They're all over the road. They, they lose reality for a while. So there is a correlation there that he's making. He's not talking about being out of control, your tongue being out of control, falling over, slain in the spirit, flopping around on the floor like you had not got any good sense, crying uncontrollably and different things like that. But in the Bible, there are individuals, they both laugh, they shout, they jump for joy. In one place in Second Chronicles, the temple gets erected there, and the ones that don't know about the history, they get excited about it, and they're over here shouting and praising God at the top of their lungs, and the old people see the same thing, and the Bible says they're weeping and crying, and both of them are filled up. Amen. It's not one certain manifestation. Right. It's like the body of Christ in 1 Corinthians chapter number 12. There's some eyeballs, there's some hands, there's some feet, there's some ears, there's some eyes, there's some noses. There's different things that are there. It's all the body, but it all is different. There's different manifestations. Some people shout, some people don't shout. It don't mean one is more filled than the other one's filled. One can be filled with the flesh and don't want to shout because he's worried about the emotion of the thing. I don't know what it, what it is, but the Bible does teach about shouting. It teaches about singing. It teaches about tears. It teaches about laughter. It teaches about joy. It teaches about happiness. Those kind of things are emotional things, and they're driven emotionally. So sometimes the Spirit will minister to you emotionally. He comforts you. Amen. What is that comforted feeling? Well, it's not physical. It's a feeling. It's something that you sense. It's a, it's a sense of peace. What is that? It's an emotion. The Lord's not, it's not this robotic sort of stuff. You want to be careful about this stoic kind of a deal where there's no emotion at all in anything. It's just, you know, it's just all stiff and stoic. No, listen, man, you get excited about catching a big bass. You get excited about killing a good-sized deer or killing a hog or something like that. You get excited about a ball game. You get excited about your kids doing well in school. Those are all good and natural things. Just be careful that when it comes to the Lord, you don't get religious. Amen. You understand? Amen. It's all right to nod your head. You don't have to be, you know, it's okay to, to loosen up in church. It's all right to have a good time in church. Amen. But it'll never be out of control. Right. When it's out of control, it's out of God's hands. God is wow. not the author of confusion. Amen. Some of you get a little uncomfortable when people will shout or they get a little excited or maybe they, in the old days, hey, we haven't seen it in a long time. I haven't seen it for real in a long time. But maybe some of you might remember, Brother Larry, and maybe... I mean, Brother Roger and, and Maxine used to go up to the mountains up there and when it was a real meeting, and you come into a meeting up there sometimes, and I don't care what anybody says, man, it was thick. Right. I mean, it was, it was heavy. It was what we call, I, I don't know any other way to call it, but like smoky. Not like you're seeing smoke. It's just, it's just, it's just, it's just heavy. And people would get up, old people would get up, and, and they would just run around the thing and then they'd just go sit down. Right. And they were just excited. Or they'd, you know, throw their hands up. And by the way, that's not charismatic. Right. You know, they throw their hands up. Now, you know what? We kind of put our own deal on it because the charismatics do this and this. And what we do is we go this and then we got to always throw something, whatever that is, on the end of it. Right. In, the, in the Bible, that's praising the Lord. That's funny. In the Bible, you, you, you throw up your hands, praising the Lord. Throw your hands up, you know. It's like, what do you do when the Lord comes? If somebody sticks a gun in your face, what would you do? Okay, Lord, nothing in my hands. i got nothing to give you, right? right. Good. And I'm not holding anything I shouldn't be holding. Right. Anyway, yeah. so, so here's the thing you want to be careful when we're talking, when I'm going to talk about this for a few minutes. The filling of the Holy Spirit, it's like this. You know, how many of you heard me give you the illustration about the teapots in Romania? Can you raise your hand? Raise them up high. 
Well, nearly everybody's in here. So some of you that don't know that illustration, ask somebody else and they'll tell you. But basically it goes this way. <laughs> I like to tell the story. Uh, we're over in Romania and we're teaching this the story. And we're trying to teach him, and man, it got good. Man, I mean, Brother Lentz is up there, he's Rex, and everyone, he's teaching some stuff on Revelation, and he starts talking about the rapture, and he's making the delineation because they believe in a general judgment. And so they believe in a second coming. They don't believe in a rapture. They're taught they're amillennial, they're postmillennial. They don't believe, they don't believe that anything's going to happen until after the kingdom comes on earth and all that stuff. And so he's got all these charts up here and going through the thing, and, and I, I got excited, and I was just like, Woo! Amen! And man, I mean, it was like, they all just, you thought you were in an independent Baptist church, man. They just turned around and looked at me like, you know, what's the matter? And Lentz looked at me and he was like, you know, like that. And I said, you know, like, couldn't help it. So then I got up there and I was talking about the crucifixion and talking about the Lord because they we're in the providence of Blad, the providence of Blad, where Blad the Impaler was. And so I get to talking about how they use the impaling of people. Then I use that to transition into the cross and that kind of a deal. And I started talking about the cross. And they said human blood, but the Lord's blood was shed. And Lynch jumps up and goes, glory, like that. And then I went. You know, and he, he made a face at me and he goes, man, that's good. Well, they didn't understand that. So we talked that night after we got done with everything. And he goes, I'm going to change things tomorrow. And I said, okay, well, good. So he gets up the next day and he's up there and he's talking through Milcher, our interpreter. And he draws out this picture of a tea kettle. And he said, what that is, is, is we're just amen in the preaching. We're amen in the Lord. We're agreeing with what's being said. And you get excited. And that what happens is, is it comes out. And they're looking at you like, what? Because if you go to their churches, they are dead orthodox. All the men sit on this side. All the women sit on this side. And they may sit there and have tears running down those little dirty faces. But they do not. I mean, everything is sung in a minor key. Now, you guys know the difference that no music, but a minor key is like, it's like a death march. Every song, is, there's no joy in it. It's just all just like most of our, our music. It's just kind of like, I am bound for the promised land. I am bound for the, like that. It is just dead. I mean, it's like you're going to a funeral. And so we're trying to explain this to them, and they're all sitting there, and they're, they're crowded around in that room. And then Brother Lent said, I got it. And he walks over to the stove, and there's a tea kettle, and we put that thing on every day to boil water to make coffee and stuff because it was cold in there. We only had a wood-burning stove, and it was about 30 degrees outside, and, and you you're have to preach in your overcoat and stuff. And so Lent gets that teapot. And he said, you know, everybody knows when Milton says, you know, teapot and all that. And he said, what sound does the teapot make when the water boils? And, you know, and then they kind of hesitate, and then he whistles. And he goes, you know, it goes, boop, like that. And he said, so when Brother Peacock hollers amen, or I holler glory, or one of the other fellows that was in us says, you know, amen, or hallelujah, he said, that's just the teapot boiling over, and you're releasing the steam like that. And you could see it kind of grab them just a little bit. And then he got up there, and he got to talking about something, and then all of a sudden they got all excited, and then all of a sudden they were going, boop. <laughs> they didn't know to say amen. I don't know what it would have been in their language, but that was, that was their understanding. Now listen, that's what being filled with the Spirit is. It not only enables you, but sometimes it boils over. Sometimes you get excited. I mean, when I talked to Mama Utley this morning on the telephone, I mean, there was a definite difference when I talked to her a couple of days ago because now she says, you know something, I know. And she started talking about heaven. She started talking about I'm going to see him again. Amen. She started talking about, boy, it sure is good to know he's not suffering anymore. Right. And you could hear the pace of her voice start picking up. And she said, well, it's just, it, well, it's, well, it's just good when somebody dies and you know where they're going when they die. Amen. And that was her way of just kind of excitedly letting off that steam. So sometimes that happens. And if it doesn't happen to you, that's okay. It's not we're looking for a sign to see if you're filled with the Holy Ghost. Amen. But the Bible does tell you to be filled with the Holy Ghost for a reason. That is an indicator that you have the ability to go through the power, have the power under the power of the Holy Spirit to go through the trouble, the trials, the difficulty. But every now and then he throws you a candy bar and says, hey, just enjoy being in me. Amen. 
So you want to be careful about just being too religious and too stoic all the time where there's no utterance at all. Singing is a way to release that pressure valve sometimes. When you sing to the Lord, you should sing to the Lord as if you really are glad to be saved. Amen. And when somebody gets up to teach you something or preach something and the Lord ministers to you, you should say, well, thank God, man, that had to have come from God. So you're saying amen to the Lord right. or you're agreeing with what's being said. Timing is an important thing. Some people only amen the things they have right and everybody else has wrong. <laughs> Some people amen to show how much knowledge they have. There's all kinds. And nobody, everybody's like, I ain't amen in that one. But whatever their reason for amening, it shouldn't keep you from amening. That's right. Maybe they got it out of whack, but they're trying. Maybe they're whacked out. Maybe they're, but they're trying. Maybe they're being a showboat, but they're trying. Well, I don't want to be a showboat. Don't worry, you won't be, but sometimes you are by not doing anything. Right. And by the way, ladies, I'm fixing to upset most of the brethren right now. It's okay for you to say amen. amen. You can't right. preach in, the, in this place. You don't been, and preaching is not publishing the gospel to somebody. Right. You're not preachers. But you can agree and you can say, the Bible says, let everything that have breath praise the Lord. Amen. Now, I know a lot of preachers that think when a woman comes in, they can't, they're not allowed to say anything in the service. Well, if she has a question, well, amen ain't a question. <laughs> but I've known some women that they amen certain things to try to preach through the preacher. <laughs> amen. That's good preaching. Y'all need to listen to that now. <laughs> like, uh, okay. <laughs> we got one of those. And the temptation is, is, well, they might listen if you would hush your mouth. <laughs> They're not going to listen now just to make you mad. You know, you get it like that every now and then, especially when you get a little bit bigger meeting. But, but amen in something, if God ministers to you, it's all right to say amen. That's not out of place. Now, if you get to where you're screaming and running across the pews and stuff like that, and you're out of order and you're jumping around like you hadn't got any sense, well, then I'm probably going to say, okay, let us know when you're done. <laughs> but there's nothing wrong with... Jump it up and shout, hallelujah, praise the Lord, or amen, if God ministers to you, whether it's through singing or preaching. That's being filled with the Holy Spirit. Amen. It's also a good mask for acting like you are when you know you're not. True. Amen. See, I like that's, the, that's called the muted amen. <laughs> There's enough of you that said it that it's still loud enough to be heard, but it's kind of like, mm, yeah, amen. <laughs> yeah, there's that too, preacher. Isaiah chapter 14, quickly, Isaiah 14. Good to be in church on a Wednesday night. Amen. Uh, the cloud sometimes can indicate judgment. For a lot of people, what they would see as judgment for us is a blessing. That's right. A lot of times that cloud comes and that smoke comes, and in the second coming it does have to do with judgment. But for you and me, we're looking for that cloud. Amen. My wife said to me we had to go through uh, uh, a place up here to get some stuff over here at Walmart a while ago. And, and uh, so we walked in the door and got the stuff and ran through there and all that kind of deal. And she saw something. She said, man, I'm going to tell you what, the devil must be coming really soon. And I said, even so, come on. Because yeah. I know when he shows up, I'm already gone. Yes, sir. Amen. But sometimes you get this sense of you're living in a very evil, very wicked yes. world. And you see certain things that go on. And it just sort of all of a sudden is a very sobering thing. Like, man, we're losing the battle. Amen. I mean, it's a miracle to me that people are in church at all anywhere on, a, on any night, let alone a Wednesday night. You folks are like the last of the Mohicans. <laughs> really? Yeah. You ever seen that last yes, of the Mohicans? Yes. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's got a great soundtrack to it, man. It makes you think of the second coming of Christ. Anyway, Isaiah chapter number 14. Isaiah 14. Listen, listen, before you get all jacked up and whacked out, all right, let me just help you with something. The most wicked thing you can put before your eyes is the mirror and the person looking back at Amen. you. Amen. Right. You understand? Yes, You're not sir, spiritual sir. if you do or you don't have a box. Right. 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 Do we know? I know people don't have a television and they got a computer. So what do you do about Well, I have to have the computer for work. Yeah, really? What about all these sites you're going to and all this news you're looking for and all this? You know, well, I, I watch my movies on the computer, but I don't have a TV. <laughs> You get all kinds. What you have or don't have doesn't make you spiritual. Can you control what you got? If you can't control it, I don't care if it's a shotgun. If your temptation is to pick it up and want to shoot somebody with it, then you might want to get rid of it. Amen. 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 I mean, unless they need shooting, you know. But <laughs> Isaiah chapter 14. Y'all can't take a joke. Verse 31. Verse 31. The Bible says, Howl, O gate, cry, O city, thou, O old Palestinia, art dissolved, for there shall come from the north a 
smoke and none shall be alone in his appointed time. He's talking about the second coming of Christ. Come to the book of uh, Isaiah chapter number 6. Isaiah chapter number 6. Just give you a couple of these. In 2 Chronicles chapter 5, most of you remember that passage. The Bible says that Shekinah glory came down and smoke filled the tabernacle. So much so that the people were unable to stand to minister. Now, if that's not thick, I don't know what is. Right. The fellow says, oh, all these people come in and they say they experience the Holy Ghost like that. Listen, I've been in meetings before where it seemed that the Lord was in there so strong that I just sat there. I didn't know, I didn't know to say amen. I didn't, know to, I didn't know to do I just sat there. I was afraid to do anything. I didn't want to run him off. It was just sweet. It was just there. I just knew. Whether anybody else is getting ministered to it or not. I've been in other meetings and I'm sitting there and things are going on. And it's almost like I'm not there. I'm not trying to be spooky, but it's kind of like, man, what happened? I've been here for three hours. I didn't even realize I'd been here. The preaching got so good, it's like I go to another place somewhere for a while. Right. That's, that's the Holy Spirit ministering to you. It's another world. It's a sixth sense. Amen. So you don't want to don't wanna go, oh, you know, now listen, if all of a sudden I go to another place and you see my eyes roll back in my head and I start unsula shuntai, untai, and a bow tie, you can be sure something got a hold of me and it ain't holy. Amen. So it's come smack me right then when that happens. <laughs> if I look like Jaws before he bites you and my eyes roll back in my head and you know, all of a sudden I'm walking around like a zombie and ain't got no sense, that ain't God. Amen. That's not God. So what you've got to realize is, is that there's certain times if you'll yield and get your cotton-picking flesh out of the way, the Lord will minister to you. It's called being filled with the Holy Spirit. So they set up that tabernacle there, and the Lord comes down there, and the priests are ministering. They're doing what they're supposed to do, and the people are singing and shouting, and they get to singing and shouting, and all of a sudden the Lord, they're singing and shouting, and all of a sudden they're singing and shouting, Amen. and then the Lord comes down there. And when he gets there, everybody shuts up and gets down. The priests were unable to stand to minister. The presence of God was so strong in that place. Now, ladies and gentlemen, that I mean they got rubber-legged and all that other kind of stuff. That meant they just said, well, God's here. We need to just sit down and shut up and just Amen. enjoy the presence of God. Amen. You get up to the judgment seat of Christ. I promise you, I guarantee you this, your head will be down Amen. and you will not have the ability to put one foot in front of another. You won't be able to move. You'll just be down on your face and thinking, man, I've never been in a place like this. What in the world is Amen. going on here? And there'll be something inside you wanting to come out, and boy, and it's wanting to scream and holler and shout, and it's so glad to be home, and there'll be something on the other side saying, man, don't do nothing, don't draw attention <laughs> to yourself, and you'll be, you'll be whacked out of nobody's business, and I'll be laying right there with you. Preacher, what do we do? Shut up, I don't know. <laughs> don't speak unless spoken to. That's what I'm going to tell you. But then the Lord will let that thing go, and you know what happens when he lets the thing go after the judgment? You know what the Bible says? They're gathered around up there around that throne. You know what they're doing? They're singing and they're shouting and they're throwing their crowns at the feet of Jesus. And all of a sudden there's a manifestation of that that takes place. You ever notice what happens? Maybe you don't know this. Here's a way that the Holy Spirit will minister, minister to you sometimes. He'll fill you up sometimes and make you feel so, so dirty. He'll put you under conviction. Holy Spirit fills you up and all of a sudden he gets ready to go into that room and you're like, ah, door's locked. And he's like, yeah, I don't really pay attention to doors. Let me in there. No, I don't really want you to go in there. Ah, let me go in there. How come you won't let me go in there? Well, I don't really want you to see what's in there. Well, why not? Conviction comes. So what do you do? Well, so you can enjoy the presence of the Holy Spirit. Instead of being convicted by the Holy Spirit, you go get the thing right. Let him in. Amen. Let him clean you up. And then enjoy the fellowship you have with him. Amen. That's why we do the Lord's Supper the way that we do. You come down and get things right between you and so you can enjoy having dinner with him. Amen. That's how the thing is. All right, Isaiah chapter number 6. Look at Isaiah chapter number 6 and go to verse number 1. In the year the king Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims, one had six wings, twain he covered his face. <clears throat> Excuse me, each one had six wings. Twain he covered his face, and twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved, and the voice of him that cried, watch it, and the house was filled with... One place it's judgment and one place it's a blessing. Amen. See it? Yes, sir. For me and you it's a blessing. Right. Amen. We embrace it. Amen. But other people see it as judgment. Right. You, some, some people, they get, they, uh, they're real close to the Lord, you can tell. And all of a sudden the Lord will minister to them. is helping through a difficulty, a trial, a problem, a difficulty, whatever's going on, situation in their life. And the Lord will minister through a song or something. And they have what we used to call when, years ago, they call it an excited utterance. They just, they just, they just... Oh, man, hallelujah, glory, God, that's good. Like Miss Lovelady, she would just get, 
carried away sometimes. That old woman, man, all of a sudden, it's like somebody hit her with a cattle prod or something, and she'd jump up out of that thing. Ninety-something years old, man. I mean, just, I mean, skin and bones, and that's all. Nothing else, man. And I don't even know how the old woman would be able to get to church. Somebody had to pick her up and nearly about put her in the pew. And then all of a sudden, man, she'd jump up, and she'd come down, and sometimes she'd sing, I'm satisfied, and sometimes she'd just come down the altar like this, just walk across like this. Old-fashioned old lady. Big highfalutin church, you know, and make all the people upset. And they go, oh, God, here she goes again. And she'd come down the aisle like that, and she'd walk across, and sometimes he'd just keep right on preaching. And she'd come out like this. Ninety-something years old, she's entitled to do what she wants to do, as far as I'm concerned. And she'd get down here, walk out the back, and then go over there and sit down, never say nothing else. I never realized what I was seeing back then. Now I was in a Southern Baptist church. That's a woman who'd been around real praise uh, services with the Lord, had been in some real situations where, you know what she figured? Man, God just ministered to me. I don't care whether you want to get in on it or not. I'm getting in on it. And that old gal would get up and come down there, and like I said, sometimes she'd sing, sometimes she'd mutter, nothing you couldn't understand. Sometimes she'd just be saying, well, praise the Lord. Well, just praise the Lord. Well, praise the Lord. Well, pra-. She'd say that for, it'd take her five minutes to walk down front and walk out the back. I can't wait to hear it to see that old white-headed old saint when I get up there. And just see her in a glorified body and say, man, what's it like to wind up up here in heaven and the Lord saying, I marked every one of those down, sister. Man, I pray for a whole congregation full of people like that. That woman's not embarrassed, not ashamed at all, man. I mean, she loved the Lord, boy. You could just, just had God all over her. You ever been around people like that? You want to get around somebody like that every now and then. You go up there in North Carolina, you get around Mama Utley. Preacher Utley, he can pray and all that and all. He's a preacher and good preacher and all, but Mama Utley. There's something when that woman starts to pray, especially when she's up on that mountain in the, at the rock, and she gets to pray, you're thinking, whew, man, good night. And it's just strong coming off of her. And she prays that way and prays out loud. And you watch her. When I'm, when I'm up there preaching, she took a shine to me for whatever reason. She likes me. And so when I'm preaching, whether I'm there or somewhere else, if, there, if I'm around, she's coming to the meeting, and she comes to the meeting, and she'll sit right there, usually where Debbie, Miss Debbie's sitting right there, and she'll sit there during the whole service, and you'll see her, like my wife a lot of times, you'll see her going. And she's praying for me while I'm preaching. And I'm saying, pour it on, sister, pour it on. <laughs> you say, well, that's what puts the plug in the wall. That's old-fashioned stuff. You people look like you're scared to death. <laughs> Not nothing to be scared of. Now here, let me show you this. Big John asked this question earlier. Every time I say that, I want to say, Big Bad John. We <laughs> <laughs> were down in the mine shaft. And, oh, no, anyway. <laughs> sorry, man. Sorry. 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 Big John. <laughs> ah, Tennessee Ernie Ford. You know he's dead now. He was out picking peas and the Jolly Green Giant stepped on him. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> you heard about Lord, the Santo and the Lord and Ranger, the big movie out now and all that other kind of stuff. They're out there running around there. One time they're all surrounded by Indians everywhere all over the creation, man. They're fixing to come in there and they're talking about scalping them. They're making a big circle and that kind of a deal. And Lone Ranger looks over at Tonto and he says, what are we going to do now? And Tonto says, I don't know what you're going to do, white man. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. Y'all so nervous. <laughs> So nervous. Now, now watch. Here's what happens. Here's what happens. They they mimic the move of the Holy Spirit by using music. So what they do is is they get you stirred up emotionally with music, and they mimic the move of the Holy Spirit. And the next thing you know, you think it's the Spirit. It's your emotion or another spirit, but it's not the Holy Spirit. So one of the things you got to understand is is that what they're doing is is just like in Acts chapter 16. You have an individual who has the ability to divine spirits and stuff, and she's opening up, and every time that preacher goes to pray, the Bible says, she opens up and goes, man, these are great preachers, aren't they? Oh, and they're a real blessing. Boy, they're really a blessing. These are the greatest preachers we've ever heard. Boy, we really need preaching like this and stuff like that. And all of a sudden, Paul turns around and says, would you shut your cotton pick him out? That's the, the, the today's language for uh, shut up. You've got another spirit in you. Right. See, it looks right, but it ain't right. 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 So you have to have the spirit of discernment. I've seen the Lord move in places where there's no music or no, no uh, piano, no organ, no, no orchestra, none of the things like that, just people singing a piano. And God come in there and move in there and minister to people with the words of the song. You don't have to have a beat. But they're mimicking that today. All right, so in one place you see it's judgment. In another place, it's a blessing. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't want God's judgment on me. I want to be filled with the Holy yes. Spirit. Amen. And I'm, I'm getting where now. I didn't always do this. I used to pray before I preached the Lord to fill me with the Holy Spirit. 
But now I'm praying the Lord fill me every day. You know what I find out? I find out it's much easier to be a better husband than when I'm filled with the Holy Spirit than when I'm not. Good. I never prayed and asked about it. And the Lord dealt with me about it. So well, why not? Yeah. I can enable you can do all things through sure. Christ. Yeah. You aren't a very good husband, but I can make you a good one. But you need a little help, buddy. You need some special help. So why don't you ask me to be filled up? Good, my tank clangs a lot on Monday morning. I mean, I, I, I mean I'm just literally wrung out on Monday morning. And so I realized that part of the problem was that I just accepted it had to be the norm. Sure. Well, you can still be physically tired, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Amen. Help you not to be so crabby and cranky and not be so hard on yourself. Amen. I'm bad about it. I get hard on myself, real hard on myself, especially somebody. Fifty people can come by and go, that's the greatest thing I ever heard. Man, I don't believe them send a text, send a message, whatever. One person can come by, and it seems like they got a hat pin that long. And they got, well, I don't know why everybody was so excited about that. Didn't do nothing for me. I mean, it's just like, I'm done, man. Listen to the one over the other people. And you know, had individuals that come to the altar and weep and cry and get right with God and all that other kind of stuff. And an individual walk out mad as a hornet and call you up on the phone. And, well, I don't know what all the emotion was about. And you're thinking, man, you're worried about the one instead of the other ones. Well, okay, somebody got a blessing in spite of the preacher. So what you want to be done, you want to have done for you is you want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, and you want the Lord to come down and to minister to you that way. Look in First uh, Kings chapter, well, I'll go to Exodus chapter 40. Let me just hit this one more and then we'll move on. Exodus chapter 40. Does this help you at all? Amen. <laughs> you get up there in heaven, it'll be, it'll be plenty, plenty thick for you when you get up there. I like it when the Lord moves in. Amen. I, I like it when he starts ministering to people. I like to see that thing take place. Man. <laughs> Exodus chapter number 40. Look, if you will, in verse number 34. This is talking about a cloud. Verse uh, 34. Then a cloud covered the tent of the congregation. The glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Cloud covered the congregation. The glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Aren't you supposed to be filled with the Spirit? Yes, Aren't you the tabernacle? Aren't you God's tabernacle? Yes, and it, don't you, in your body, dwells him? Isn't that what he says? Yes, your body is a temple unto God. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. Well, what's it filled with? Is it his house or the house of somebody else? Right. You making room for him? It's not just jam Jesus in there and let him get all the other stuff out. There's more to it. You've got a purging process. Amen. Kids are going to get a little bit of that stuff at camp, but there's some things you do have to be willing to get rid of to make room for him. Amen. He wants to know if you're willing to move in. I've been stayed at some people's house sometimes, and they say, yeah, well, you can stay with us, and you go in there, and they haven't made any provision at all. They haven't moved any closet space out. They haven't put any towels out or nothing like that, and you can tell right off the bat, they weren't expecting you, and they ain't glad you're there. <laughs> And so you come in there, you've got to kind of crowd your way in there and try to make room for yourself. And you feel like a complete jerk while you're there because you realize they didn't really want me to be here. And I'm here. And what am I supposed to do? Because this is where they told me to stay. Right? right. All right. Well, how about the Lord? Does he feel welcome when he moves in? Do you make room for him? You put out some fresh towels. Do you get rid of the junk that's in there? Do you get the mildew off the, the tub ring off the tub? And do you put fresh linens on the bed? Do you make him feel like he's welcome when he comes there? Or is he still trying to drive out the same stuff he was trying to drive out 10 years ago? Why, why should it be that way? You know what? As you grow as a Christian, it should not be all about all the junk that goes on with your flesh. It starts to change inwardly like that bitter envy and strife and that malice and, and all of those hard feelings that you feel toward one another and stuff like that and unforgiving people and that kind of a deal. That's where you start when you mature. You know, you get all clean on the outside, as clean as a house tooth, and the Lord's in there going, man, I can't hardly breathe in here. It's a stinking tight in here. It's called grieving the Holy Spirit. You're not giving him any room to expand. There's too much junk in the way. And the Lord's done, he's not going to force you to kick it in. Well, I'll, I'll here, I'll kick it out for you. I'll clean it out for you. He's like, if you don't want me here, fine. I'll just stay in this little corner over here. The passage is a, is a, a picture of that, a type of that, a shadow of that is in Nehemiah. They let Tobiah come in there. And they take all the stuff of the house of God out so that it makes room for Tobiah. Amen. And Tobiah's in there and he takes the place of the priests and he takes the place of the Levites and he takes the place of the singers and he takes the place of the people that minister the altar and minister the word and do all those other kinds. He kicks everybody out and brings himself in there and his entourage and there's no room in there for the Lord to minister. There's another place over there that talks about uh, them going up there to Damascus and Ahab goes up there and he gets to talking to this other king and they get to shooting their mouth back and forth and back and forth and he gets to talking to them. the next thing you know he says, you know what you better do? You need to go down there and take that, 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 uh, that uh, 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 altar 
and you need to replace that with this one from Damascus. It's a lot prettier and a lot nicer, and it's not all brass and bloody and all that other stuff. Why don't you set that one over here, and let's get this one here. And so they replace the altar. Well, buddy, that's where God meets you is at the altar. You know, so what happens is they're trying to get you to replace the altar with some, some facade, some, right. some counterfeit of what's, what's God. No, God still hadn't changed when it comes to that. Amen. You still have a responsibility to make room for him. Amen. That's old-fashioned Christianity. Amen. We, I don't know about you. Maybe you got it down pat now. Maybe you've been saved long enough. It's kind of like, yeah, Lord's got plenty of room in my life. But my goodness, man, right when I think I made him a little bit of room, he's like, well, I ain't got nowhere to lay my head. He said, you don't think there was any room for me in the end? I can't hardly make wiggle room in here where you're at. You've got me staying in worse than a barn. You looked at yourself lately? Oh my. You see what I'm saying? Amen. You have to make room for him to show him he's welcome. That's Is he welcome? Man. Can you get your pride out of the way? Good. Good for you. I, I, I'll say this. I don't usually say this. If you weren't here for Sunday, you should get Sunday morning's messages. Mm -hmm. Sunday morning's messages dealt with something. Now, I, I don't know. Maybe you don't have a problem with that. But from the number of phone calls and letters and texts and other junk emails and everything I've gotten from it, it hit us all right between the eyes, man. Amen. I mean, it knocked the tar out of us. Amen. Sunday morning was like, whew, holy smokes, man. <laughs> I mean, the smoke came in and it was judgment. It wasn't, you know, a blessing. It was like, good night. I get to looking at that passage and I think about Hezekiah. The Bible says and his heart was lifted up with pride and the Lord was going to crush him for it. But then he repented of it. You get to looking at David. You know what happened to David over there in 2 Samuel, oh, about 24 or so there? 1 Chronicles 21 is a correlating passage to that. The Lord, uh, the devil moves David. His heart's lifted up there with pride, and he numbers the children of Israel. 70,000 people died because of that. You get Herod over there in Acts chapter 12. It's on the left-hand page up there at the top left-hand corner. Herod's up there right after Pete's been let out of prison, and he stands up there, and he starts talking. They said, is he not a god? And he's like, yeah, baby, this is a God talking to you here, man. No <laughs> doubt about it. And the Bible says that he sends an angel and eats him of the worms because of his pride. Mm -hmm. I thought, my goodness, man, if that thing's true, it's all through the Bible. In the Bible, I'll show you this later on, not, probably not going to be tonight, but in the Bible, that leprosy shows up. You know what that leprosy does? That leprosy in the Bible is a type picture of pride because it shows up. You know where leprosy shows up? This may be strange to you. Leprosy shows up in your flesh. It shows up in your clothes, yes. and it shows up in your house. Yes. Don't you think that's weird? It can become attached to any of those things. Yes. Well, it's a type of sin, but it's also a type of pride, a picture of pride. It's a, a manifestation of how an individual lifts himself up and talks about himself and thinks about himself and always does. That's what I find out. And only by pride cometh contention, the Bible says. And so I find out that when people are constantly in contention with other people, there's pride present if the Bible's right. Amen. And nobody can do it right. Nobody can do it like you can do it. Nobody can sing, preach like you. Nobody can preach. Nobody can teach like you. Nobody can play like you. Nobody can clean like you. Nobody can build like you. Nobody can run like you. Nobody can shoot like you. Nobody can this and nobody. That's pride. Amen. And you know what I found out? I found if you're proud in those things, you'll be arrogant in other things. Right. You may be the top of the line and all that. Talented people are the ones that have the most trouble with that stuff. Us people that ain't got no talent, it's kind of like, yeah, what do we got to be proud about? Amen. But it'll creep up on you because then you'll be proud of not having any talent. Right. Amen. 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 You can be proud of running a computer. Nobody can run a computer like me. That's my program. I ran that program. I'm the one that wrote that. Nobody can use that program. I've got my, there's my copyright on that. I want everybody to know who wrote that program. What is that? Right. Well, it's for the glory of God. My foot. It's for give me the combination to the safe so I can figure out what went on because you got all the reins is what that is. Come on, Brother Lance, help me a little. Amen. Brother Lance has to deal with me. Brother Brad has to deal with me. Every now and then, Brother Sam has to deal with me. He's like an apple fella, you know. But the other guys, they know how to deal with, with other stuff. And, and, uh, but I have to call him for the apple stuff and all that. And, 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 and you know what the deal is? They have to be thinking to themselves, this guy must be an idiot. <laughs> they don't say it, but you can just tell. It's like, you can hear this. <sighs> What's wrong now? <laughs> What'd you lock up now? You know, kind of thing. Well, I, I can't, can't figure some of that stuff out. It don't make any sense. I want to get an ax and just bust it all to pieces. But I, I know that's not the thing to do. But it'd be real easy for them to be thinking, well, you know what, I'm smarter than most people, so you need to call me and I'll tell you how to get out of it. 
instead of saying, hey, here's how you do it, next time you get into it, you can fix it yourself, you don't have to have me. You see how that pride is? That pride can get on you on everything. Now, I'm, I'm preaching now. No friends, no family, no foes right now. Nobody's my enemies. I'm not trying to butter up to nobody. I'm saying you can be proud about anything. Amen. Ladies, Amen. you can be proud about how clean your house is. Somebody comes over, you're cleaning your house. You know why you're cleaning your house? You're worried about what somebody's going to say about you. And then when everything is spotless and they can put on the white glove and come around there and, my goodness, you have the cleanest house I've ever seen in my life. You say, no, it's just because I'm hygienic. No, you're not. You're proud. <laughs> And you walk into somebody, you know how I know? You walk into somebody's house. My God, they didn't even hit the day, baseboards. Who don't know the dust baseboards? You're proud. Every picture in your house, you got a level on it. You walk into somebody's house, that, that picture's out of level. I can just see that. It's out of level. You're proud. You're peacocking it. <laughs> fellow called me today. He said, hey, I'm, I'm out there. He, said, he sent me a message thing, and he said, I'm done with digging the hole. He's got these big 100-gallon trees coming in, big, big trees, and 17, 18 foot tall, and all that other kind of stuff. He said, yeah, I got out there. He said, I just, uh, he sent me a message, and he said, I peacocked it. <laughs> what he was saying is, is I was proud of the peacock because of how I was able to work the excavator to get the holes dug. <laughs> and I thought, yeah, you don't have to be saying that right now. We've been preaching on pride lately. <laughs> I peacocked it, so you're proud of the holes. Yeah, he was proud of the holes. Now, there's nothing wrong with taking credit for what the Lord's allowed you to do, but realize that none of us deserve any credit because God gave us all the ability Amen. you have. Amen. I don't care if it's with your fingertips. I don't care if it's with your brain. I don't care if it's with your mouth. I don't care if it's with your brawn. Right. Amen. Blow your mannerism in your head and you're done. But, you, but here's the thing I'm learning. I'm learning that even when it comes to my driving and somebody cuts in front of me, my pride gets me. Who are you to cut in front of me? And the Lord said, who are you that they shouldn't cut in front of you? Yeah. <laughs> At least you had enough sense to stop. Somebody else might have rammed into them, and then we'd have had a wreck. He took my place in line. I was like, why shouldn't he? A lot of those things wouldn't happen to us if we just go ahead and admit that if our problem is us, and then we'd be able to go through life a whole lot better without the contention that we have. Amen. You run into contention with other people. When you're under conviction, you know what happens? You're throwing javelins at other people. I got a whole thing on it, man. I'm not done with it yet. It's all through there. That humility. Humble yourself. That's a choice you have to make. You want to get the devil off your back? Humble yourself. That's hard to do. Humble yourself means when you feel like you have more sense than somebody who's doing something and you want to chastise them or you want to say something smart elegantly about them, humble yourself and shut your mouth. You want to belittle somebody? You guys are bad about it. I know this is round two, but you guys are bad about it. You sarcastically cut people down, and you think, oh, it's just joking. It ain't funny. Amen. Amen. I've seen some of you guys do it with your wives, and I'm embarrassed for them. I'm bad about it sometimes. I say stuff I probably shouldn't be saying. I shouldn't be saying. There's no probably to it. Sometimes I think things I'm sure embarrasses her, and I shouldn't do that. Who was that? Pride. Amen. 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 I want to get better. Amen. I get into contention with the Lord. You know what the problem is? I think I know more than he does. Right. Proud. How dare me? The arrogance of me to think I know more. God, what are you doing this to me for? Like, like, I, like I know what's better? Right. Amen. I was reading Job the other day, and I hit that. I just happened to open to the passage. I don't do Bible roulette, but I happened to open while I was looking for my place there. I opened the Bible. Where was thou when I laid the foundation of the world? Where when I did this? And where when I hung the world on nothing? Where was I? And I'm thinking, I said... Okay, all right. <laughs> but that's the thing that gets us. We're proud of everything we do. You know, I'm, proud of, I'm proud of my kids, like you made them. Right. <laughs> what a thing, man. You get ready, you, you know, you reach in, you get, you, you get your wallet out, you know, and you pull it out. And let me show you my pride and joy here, baby, you know. And pictures of your kids, like you made them. <laughs> Isn't that funny? Weird, ain't it? Back to the book of Exodus. My oh, goodness, man. I need to show you this thing in Leviticus. Well, let's just finish this here. The cloud covered the tent of the congregation. The glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle, and Moses was not able to enter into the tent of the congregation. What? Why couldn't you get in there, Moses? God was in there. God so filled that place that had been sanctified and prepared for him that the flesh couldn't get in. Do you see the picture there? 
You ever wonder why Paul says to us in the book of Hebrews, let us lay aside every sin, I mean, uh, let us lay aside every way, and the sin that doth so easily beset us? Yeah. You ever wonder why those sins keep coming back in there? Because when we try to get rid of them, we don't go ahead and make preparation for the Lord to move in there, so they keep walking back into the temple. The Lord came down there in the place they prepared for him. Moses built it, right? According to the Lord's specs, right? right. Did what God told him to do, right? Obedience. Amen. Got it ready. The Lord said, I'm in here. Moses like, hey, how are you? Boom. <laughs> like running the Michelin tire man. Boom. Moses like, I can't get in there. The Lord's like, no, I'm in here. You can't come in here when I'm in here. It don't work like that, Moses. Watch. The Bible says the cloud abode thereon, the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And when the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle, the children of Israel went onward on all their journey. But if the cloud were not taken up, then they journeyed not till the day that it was taken up. They stayed put. Security. Steadfast. Unmovable. Unshaken. The Lord hadn't moved. I'm staying right here. What? I'm just going to enjoy having time with the Lord. I don't have to be moving all the time to be doing something. Sometimes you're sitting and doing something. Amen. Verse 38, For the cloud of the Lord was upon the tabernacle by day and fire on it by night in the sight of the house of Israel throughout all their journeyings. So the type picture that I want you to see in this particular thing come to James chapter number 1, and I'll close for tonight. James chapter number 1. Hebrews, James. Chapter number 1. I don't mean to keep pounding that, that pride thing, but that's... Uh, there, there's, a, there's, a, there's a lot in that. You realize it's like, it's a, it is like leprosy that other people can see it and other people can tell you have it sometimes even if you don't. Over there in Leviticus 13, that's where it would show up anyway. But in Leviticus 13, it's go show the priest, go show the priest, go show the priest. Sometimes the person didn't know they had it. They didn't know what they had, but the priest could tell right away, that's leprosy, man. Other people can tell you're full of pride, but you refuse to admit you got it. I'm not proud. You talking about me? It, you, if you have to ask that, you know I'm talking about you. Full of pride. And people know you're full of pride. Why don't they tell me that? Because they're afraid you're going to pound them, that's why. Or talk about them. Or Facebook them. That's the new threat. Talk about me, I'll ruin your reputation. I'll put something on the computer. That is, that's a new threat. In school right now, you know what your kids are having to deal with? I've done the research on it. I got my facts and figures. You know what they're doing? They're not just bullying them. Like when I grew up, Mike Hartman, he bullied me. He took that, he was in junior high school with a class ring. And he turned his class ring around and he banged me on the head with it. I was about that big around. And he was in the eighth grade driving to school in a car. <laughs> and, you know, yeah, I'm not kidding. Mike Hartman. I mean, anyway, uh, Mike Hartman bullied me with that ring. He bullied everybody around him by threatening. He was big as, bigger than everybody else. Teachers were scared of him. They wouldn't say nothing to him. They just let him hang out there, and he'd drive up there in his car, smoking on his cigarettes, had him rolled up in his sleeve in those days, and listening to his, you know, rock and roll stuff and junk, and then he'd pull up and turn it off, and then he'd come to class and listen to a transistor. During, nobody would say nothing to him. Just let him be there, you know? So, at any rate, he bullied me with his fists, with his hands. He beat the tar out of me a bunch of times. But I'd like to be able to tell you there's another story where one day I got a bat and I beat him and he never beat me again. But he beat me until I finally graduated past him and then I never saw him again. He never made high school. So I, 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 I guess I left, you know. So, well, did you go beat him up? No, I never could beat him up, man. He was, anyway. Well, your kids are getting bullied nowadays with threats of what they're going to say about them on a text message or an Insta thing, Insta Instagram. picture thing, that thing, and uh, uh, the bird deal and the, Facebook deal and all the other junk that's out there. And so you know what they have to do? They got to do what they're told to do or they're afraid somebody's going to put all their information out there. I hate to tell you good people this. I hate to, God, honest to God, I hate to tell you what I'm about to tell you. Everything you put on that thing is out there and I don't care if you delete it and exit and everything else, it's there. I dealt with a lady just a few weeks ago, and she came into her pastor's office and sat down there, and she said, I don't know what to do, but I put some stuff out there. It's been 10 years ago now, and it's resurfaced. What do I do? 
I said, well, ma'am, I'm, I'm sorry. You just have to say, well, I, I made some real messes back then, and I'm sorry, and I'm ashamed of what I did, and move on, try to make light of it. I, because I said, you can't get it off. Everybody you send it to can send it to whoever they want to send it to, then they can send it to whoever they want to. And even if it's off of yours and off of the other ones, and you've un, un, block, unblocked them or b blocked them or whatever you do with them, un, unlock them or something, when you do that thing to it, it don't matter. They still got it. Right. And they can send it to whoever they want, whenever they want. Some people just keep files on that stuff so that if they ever, you get out of hand, you know what they'll do? They'll just send it out there. Well, I just use it for good things. Pedophiles use it too, folks. Yeah. Right. Put all these pictures out there and you say, well, it's just for my family. How it makes you think your family's not sending it to people that ain't the family? Right, amen. And the next thing you know, and what makes you think everybody in your family is doing things they ought to be doing? Good. Certain yeah. things ought to stay in the house. That's, I'm just my opinion. You can do it or whatever you want. You get, you, just, you stink and get so upset about that com cotton picking computer. I don't know what that is about you about that. Like all of a sudden, everybody's like, well, you've got to have it for business, and you just don't understand how it is. And you just, people can use it the right. Okay, lighten up. But a lot of people are using it the wrong way, and it has a far reaching, damaging effect, whether you want to admit that or not. Amen. It's dangerous stuff. If you can use it, fine. But you better be real careful about that stuff. That's Amen. all I'm saying to you. Use it. Why do you get so jacked up about it? What's, what's the matter? Well, using it the wrong way, no big deal. We have a webby thing here for that stuff. And people click there and there's a picture of the church and different things like that and all that kind of deal. I get that. I understand that. We don't friend it or, or book it or whatever it is. Well, you know, you'll get more people. That'd be great, wouldn't it? A preacher, I found out about you on Facebook, and then they come in here and I preach against Facebook, and they're like, <laughs> <laughs> I don't care if you got it. It don't matter. You'll notice I'm not on it. You say, why? I don't guess I can handle it. You know what would drive me crazy about it? Updating it all the time. <laughs> Checking it all the time. I, I fly quite a bit now. I go I, and, and stand there, and people are sitting there in line. They're, you know, they're like this. And and I'm looking, and, and invariably, they're, 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 they just checked it. They're updating everything. Oh, is that all you got to do, man? Well, it's important. They have to know where I'm at. Right. Your status has changed in the last 24 hours? <laughs> Now that I have made some enemies, Jim, James chapter number one. Amen. I, listen, I just wish you'd give the Lord that much time. If you are, fine. I know there's people in here who make their living doing that. I get that. I understand that. It doesn't change the fact. Good. You use it the right way, praise the Lord. You use your television the right way, praise the Lord. No problem. Then you shouldn't be upset. You should be going, amen, preacher, that's right. Amen. You should be in agreement with me right. that if that people are using it the wrong way, then that makes it look bad for those that use it the right way. Sure. That doesn't apply for liquor. Right. <laughs> I'm just checking you. <clears throat> well, preacher, you know a little for thy stomach's sake, often infirmities. Well, I don't see that you're sick or anything like that. No, preacher, I'm sick in the head. you got to have... <laughs> that don't apply for that. Right. Well, I, I understand. Up. But be careful not to get too close to the line. Man. For me, see, I couldn't handle it. For me, it's like liquor. You say, why don't you drink? Because it's a good testimony. I'm afraid of it. Man. Really? I'm scared of it. I'm afraid I might like it. Even after all the stuff and all the damage I've seen it do, personal experience, I'm afraid of it. I've seen better people than me fall by that stuff. So... I'm scared of it. It's not because I'm a teetotaling good testimony of a good Christian. No. I might like it. I'll stay away from the street corners where they're selling crack. You say, why? I don't know. I'd be one of those who takes one hit and I'd be like, yeah, man. <laughs> See y'all later. I'm out of here. I've seen people on that stuff, man, especially when they first get started on it. They ain't got a care in the world. They can get more done in 20 minutes than you can get done in five hours. And, of course, then it gets a hold of them. So I stay away from it. It's not because I'm, I'm, I'm don't ever get the ideas because I think I'm something special. It's because I know I'm not. 
Are you in James chapter number one? That's why I have to be careful with all that, the, the appearance of evil. You know? Don't bend over and tie your shoes in somebody else's watermelon patch, the old preacher used to say. They'll never be convinced that you're tying your shoes. They'll think you're stealing watermelon. Here's a good one for you. Don't drink water out of a, a beer bottle. What's the difference? So it's just water. Yeah, whatever. I used to have to occasionally go to these Christmas dilly bobs and all. You were ordered to go, and you go to the Christmas dilly bob, and they wanted to shove, a, you know, well, if you're not going to drink here, can you have some water or some? No, if I have water, they'll think it's vodka. And if I have orange juice, they'll think it's mixed with vodka. And so, no, so I have to walk around and not have anything in my hand. You say, well, what's, that's their problem. No, you see, you don't understand. It's not their problem. It's my responsibility. That's where you Christians get messed up. Amen. You always want to blame somebody else. Right, it's your responsibility to have not, not have the appearance of evil. I saw amen. Peacock at the party. He was amen. drinking. That's why I don't drink root beer. Even if I liked root beer, I wouldn't get root beer. You say, why? They make it look like long necks. Right. Yeah. Yes, they do. I'm really upsetting you all tonight, aren't I? You're like, oh, I really like root beer. Okay. Well, like your root beer then. And then don't worry about it when the kid walks by there. And I saw him drinking a beer. We pulled around one time, a Chinese place, a Sino cat over there in, uh, oh my goodness, man. No, no offense. I eat Chinese stuff, but you don't usually see cats around there. So anyhow, we pulled up here, we were running the prisons and stuff like that, and there was a couple of us there in the van, and we pulled around. The only parking place was on the, the side, back side over here, a couple of places down, and there's a, uh, one of them honky-tonk bar places there. And we pull up there in the van, and the guy that was with the preacher that was with us, he, you know, gets out, shuts the car off, and Doc says, hey, man, what are you doing? And the preacher said, we're going around there to the place to eat over around there. We got the big smorgasbord Chinese place, and got the salmon and the chicken and all that. And he goes, I know that, brother, but what are you doing? He said, I'm parking the van. We're going to have to walk around there to it. And he said, brother, you can't park this thing here. Now, that's a guy, if there was ever a guy that could care less what somebody thought, you know what he said? He said, brother, you don't understand. As soon as me and Peacock step out of this thing, they're going to say, I saw Ruckman and Peacock coming out of a bar. He said, I have no idea who might be around here. And he said, he may not be known, but they know me. And he'll be guilty by association. And so you've got to find another place to park, brother. And he said, oh, who cares? And he said, I care, brother. I care. And he said, okay, okay, all right, I'll move, you know. And he said, look, if you need to, let me out at the door of the, of the place, but, but not, you're not parked here. I'm not going to walk over here. I'm not going to park the van here. Now, see, some of you don't get that. You think, well, what's the big deal? All it takes is one word, even if it's not true, and you're done. And in the age you live in nowadays, one snapshot, Photoshop it a little bit, and they, you're done. So it's just easier to stain all the parents of evil. What is that? Old-fashioned Christianity. Say too much for me. Yeah, too much for most. Most people can't handle that. James chapter number one. I'm, I'm getting to this, I promise. <laughs> Look at verse number 22. You want to be filled with the Holy Spirit? Verse 22. Be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word, not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. That's a mirror. For he beholdeth himself, goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not forgetful hearer, but a doer of the word, a doer of the work, this man be blessed in his deed. Now, what he's trying to tell you there is, is that you've got to take what you've been hearing and you have to do something with it, or you're only deciding what you want to do in the natural sense of the word, and you'll never be filled with the Holy Spirit that way. The secret to being filled with the Holy Spirit is obedience. I'm going to do what God tells me to do. Now, if you want to be filled with the Holy Spirit, that's step number one. It comes with obedience. Step number two, you purge yourself. Get rid of the junk that's in there. The Lord says, now that ain't not a good thing. Get rid of it. And if you'll do that, then you have an opportunity to experience a successful Christian life. And I'll tell you now, on a few occasions, on one or two occasions, I've experienced that. And there's nothing like it in the world at all. I don't speak as one that's obtained at all because it's a constant process. I'm learning now, 50 years after I've been saved, I'm learning now that sometimes in the process of a day, I have to pray for the Lord to fill me with the Holy Spirit sometimes before I return a phone call so I don't get in the flesh. Because otherwise, 
that pride gets on me and then the devil's got me. All right, let's stand together and be dismissed. Woodard, if you have just a minute, I need to see you. I need to see Sam. I need to see Josh. I need to see uh, Brother uh, Daniel. I need to see Brother Lance in my office for just a couple of minutes, if I could, please. All right, uh, Deacon Larry, how about you dismiss us, would you please, sir? Lord, we're grateful.